rated T for Teen. Hello and welcome to GaiaCast, a spoiler-filled deep dive podcast into the world of Horizon from the team here at Gorilla. This is our very first episode and we're looking forward to taking a closer look, hearing some behind the scenes anecdotes and maybe even learning some new things. Our first series of episodes will be focusing on Horizon Zero Dawn, the first installment of the Horizon series, which we launched in 2017. I'm Shante and I'm joined by my co-host, Anna. How's it going today, Anna? Hey, I'm great, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you very much. <laughs> And also, uh, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, we have two guests from the team at Gorilla. How are you? Good. Hi, uh, I'm Annie Coutain. I'm a senior writer here at Gorilla. Um, yeah, and I'm part of the narrative team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm Ben McCaw. I'm the narrative director, and I was uh, the lead writer also on uh, Zero Dawn. During this first episode, we're taking a look at the hero of Horizon, Aloy, and how her character and story were designed and crafted into the beloved, exciting adventure of Horizon Zero Dawn. As we mentioned previously, this podcast series will be full of spoilers. So if you have not played Horizon Zero Dawn just yet, we recommend enjoying the game first before having a listen. Right, I'm super excited to just jump into this episode, so let's do it. So, how would you both personally describe Aloy? Um, yeah, I mean, Aloy, you know, she's driven, she's uh, intelligent, she's brave, uh, she's curious about the world around her. Uh, and those, I think, are traits that you see throughout the story, you know, in all the different quests. Uh, that's always something that, that you really see exemplified from her. Yeah, I, mean, I think when we were developing Aloy as a character, there were probably dozens of documents that we wrote about her, about her character, about uh, her upbringing. But I think like one of my favorites had this kind of sentence in it that crystallized the character for us, which is, I have it here. On nights when she shivered in the cold, counting the home fires of the village below, all that sustained Aloy was her burning need to solve the riddle of her birth, who her mother was and why she was cast out. And it was that image of her kind of sitting above the village, not being a part of it, seeing those fires burning below, you know, kind of understanding everything that she was missing is when we really crystallized, okay, yeah, that's her. You yeah. know, that's really who she is. Now, of course, she's all the things Annie just said. She's incredibly strong, driven, brave, powerful. But the core of her character is that one need, you know, like to find, to find what she finds, which is the identity of her mother. And in the game, when we fir first meet Aloy, uh, she's a baby in the care of Outcast Rost. And how did that team like go about that? Like, why do we start off as a child Aloy and not as an adult? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think um, we were very conscious uh, at the time that that wasn't just the beginning of the game. That was the beginning of the world. Mm -hmm. So I, obviously not, you know, in terms of like the big bang, like this is the, but it, just in terms of this is uh, how we're going to present the world of Horizon to the player for the first time. And there was so much that had to go into that, right? Because it's like, it's, it's complicated in a way. It's like there's uh, nature, there's tribes, there's uh, machines, and there's Aloy. And how are we going to get that all across? And we really felt like the best kickoff to that was like, you're really seeing it for the first time. I mean, like literally seeing it for the first time. And that's uh, baby Aloy, right? Yeah. And she sort of takes the place of the player. Little known thing, I'm not sure it's actually known at all, is that that was initially we had thought that that might be playable. Mm -hmm. So that uh, when Rost was moving across the landscape to go to the uh, place for the ritual, that maybe the player would actually, uh, well, there was at first an, an idea that maybe the player would control Rost. But then we actually had the idea that the, the player could control the baby, not in terms of moving, but in terms of your gaze. Right. So that would be a way to kind of keep that idea that you're sort of like rooted in this particular perspective that kind of fell away because it's actually really quite difficult to do. And we also felt that the cinematic elements were really working well. Um, and also just having kind of Ross talk to Aloy, you know, the baby as, as he kind of goes up the hill was working pretty well. So I don't think, I don't think it would have necessarily been better that way, but it was kind of a cool thought. The, um, the main thing, though, is like that was really the way we wanted to kick off the game and, and potentially a franchise, right? Which is like, you know, how can we show this for the first time? 
When we were concepting Aloy, uh, were there any other versions of that backstory? Or why did the, cho uh, the team choose for her to be an outcast? Yeah, I mean, I think being an outcast is really central to Aloy's character, you know? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, at the very beginning of the game, you see that she was cast out uh, from birth, uh, from the Nora tribe. And there's this really great moment early on in the game where she uh, sees these kids with this Nora woman picking berries. And so she picks some berries, too, and offers it to them, you know, because she wants to fit in. She wants to belong. And they just reject her and they don't want anything to do with her. Uh, and then a little bit later, you know, one of the kids actually throws a rock at her head and hurts her. Uh, so it really shows like really quickly, you know, how extreme the tribe is with how they treat outcasts, even someone who's just a kid. Um, and that creates this moment of relatability to the player because, you know, it, they just saw this little kid get hurt who just wants to fit in, just wants to belong. Um, but, and you feel bad for her. You feel like, you know, you want to help her, you want to help her succeed at, at what she wants. Uh, so in that aspect, you know, it really like just creates that emotional connection with Aloy. Uh, and then secondly, um, you have, you know, Aloy grows up as an outcast. So she, she's an outsider to the tribe. She's an outsider to the greater world around her. Yeah. Uh, and that's really similar to the player that like they're, Aloy and the player are aligned in that sense where, you know, she, it's her first time, you know, once she goes to the proving, it's her first time really interacting with people in the tribe. It's her first time interacting with the greater world when she, she leaves the sacred lands. Uh, so she's experiencing that for the first time. She's figuring out how to navigate her way through that. Uh, and so is the player. So it's, it really creates, you know, they're sharing the same experience. Yeah. And talking more about the proving, how did the team decide the events that would occur during the proving, and was there a scenario where Rost may have survived? No, I mean there really wasn't. You know, I mean the thing like this is a big thing, right? Because like people really like Rost. We love Rost. <laughs> yeah, pe people love Rost, and and like I think um, the just the way Rost came across in the game, the voice acting, his appearance, certain moments that he has with Aloy, uh, they just really resonate. And, you know, I still watch them uh, from time to time as we work on various things. And it, it really works. But there was never a time that we really thought that Rost would, would survive the proving. And I think really when you look at it from a story perspective, he has no dramatic function after the proving, after that, after what sort of becomes his death. There's really no purpose that he serves to the story after that point. Uh, and I, I like to compare this a little bit to like, and I'm sure other people made this comparison too, but to Ned Stark in Game of Thrones or also to Obi-Wan, right? In Star Wars where like, it's really difficult to imagine those things where those characters survive. And I also think just to, you know, to, to quote an old quote, like, you know, Obi-Wan is a thousand times more powerful after he's struck down. And I feel the same way about Rost, where it's basically like the memory of Rost, the things that we did with Rost's grave, uh, just the way it kind of weighs on Aloy and, and just the relationship as, as it carries forward is just more powerful uh, when he's passed on. Aloy carries a lot on her shoulders through the story, but we know from playing her that she's always prepared to help other characters in need. Um, were there any side quests that you thought were particularly important to her character development? Uh, yeah, I mean, so for me, you know, playing the game, one thing that I thought was that really stood out was the series of quests at the Hunter's Lodge with uh, Talana, because uh, I, one, I just like Talana We a love lot. Talana. Yeah. <laughs> but um, at the same time, you know, Aloy, you know, grew up as an outcast and she, you know, had Rost, but aside from that, didn't interact with anyone else. Uh, she didn't have friends. And so, you know, you have quests with with Varl, with Eren, with Petra and Vanasha, these other characters that she meets and forms friendships with. But to me, I really felt like the quests with Talana, you know, Talana is someone who's also a really good machine hunter. She's independent and driven in a lot of ways like Aloy. And so when she's taken under her wing and becomes her thrush and for the Hunter's Lodge, it really feels like they form this true friendship together. And, and that's, it was just really nice to see that she gained something like that. I think there's one quest that really, side quest, that really stands out for me, which I think is called in Zero Dawn, um, A Daughter's Vengeance. So this is the quest where Aloy uh, meets a couple other Nora, 
where it turns out that one of the Nora has left the sacred land uh, in pursuit of uh, one of the Red Raiders, and a Karja, and uh, has gotten into a lot of trouble. And it was actually, um, it was a really fun quest to develop. It was also a very difficult quest to develop because uh, it had many parts. Um, it was a quest that you could do before or after Aloy leaves the sacred land in, in various ways. So it had these kind of edge cases. And also it had this human combat um, that we were really trying to prove out at the time when you actually catch up with the guy. So it was, it was, it was cool and really instructive and, and difficult quest to, to create. But um, in terms of Aloy, I really liked it. And, and this is a little bit similar to Annie's answer because of the Nakoa character. So the Nakoa character, who is the character that kind of like leaves uh, and, you know, to never return you know, the sacred land to, to go pursue revenge. There's a lot of parallels to Aloy there where this is someone that also had the will to kind of leave the sacred land and someone who was willing to defy the authority of the matriarchs and someone who really is her own person and someone who suffers, just really suffers a lot in, in the pursuit of this vengeance. And I thought all of those things were really great parallels for Aloy. It was like, you know, it really felt like someone that she could respect and someone that, that you sort of could imagine, you know, if they could uh, meet up later, um, they would be friends. Mm -hmm. And um, actually that was something we wanted to do, but eventually I don't think it made it into the game. Uh, but um, it's just a personal favorite of mine, both, both in terms of the development and in terms of kind of what the quest actually wound up being story-wise. And talking more about the loss of Rost, you know, Aloy's parental figure and essentially her closest friend, you know, her, her, her person that she always goes to, her mentor. Uh, further on, along in the story, we meet Silence, who is a much more manip uh, manipulative and just not necessarily cruel, but maybe a character that a lot of people have trouble identifying with. Um, did the loss of Rost affect the relationship that Aloy could have built with Silence or are their interests just not compatible? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one really big difference between Silence and Ross is Ross was really was Aloy's mentor. You know, he raised her, he trained her to survive in the wilds and hunt and fight. Uh, so he really filled that role for her. Uh, whereas Silence isn't really her mentor. You know, he knows a lot about the old world. Uh, he's made all these discoveries on his own. Um, but he's not there to, to guide Aloy through those discoveries. You know, he in some ways needs Aloy to help him learn more about uh, about the past. Um, so there's just a really big difference there. And in fact, you know, it's more of a, there's more envy and more jealousy between the two of them just because, you know, if, if Silence could, he would definitely just, you know, continue on his own and he wouldn't use or associate with Aloy if, if he could. But, uh, you know, she has, because she's a clone of Elizabeth Sobeck, and she has this genetic key that allows her to go into these facilities and access this knowledge, uh, it's just something that Silence doesn't have. And so he he needs her for that. Uh, so I think that's that's more of what their relationship is. You know, he is someone that she can talk to about these discoveries and they go through a lot of that adventure together. But uh, I don't think there's too much of like a mentorship component to it. Yeah. So from early on in the story, we meet uh, impactful characters that display strong personalities and a range of emotions. Like Aloy, many of these characters experience grief, uh, determination, and just a, a willingness to broaden their scope of the world around them. So how do you balance the influence Aloy has on the characters around her and the effect that they have on her? Yeah, so I mean, you know, when we create characters, we're always trying to create real grounded characters, you know, who have their own their own desires, their own fears uh, and, and wants and and really, you know, deep dive into what makes them tick. Uh, and then, you know, they're always they're always trying to solve their own problems. They always have something that they're trying to achieve in their own life, uh, which they are you know, doing their best to to accomplish uh, up to a point, And that's usually where Aloy comes in. Um, so, and a lot of the stories you'll see in, in Zero Dawn, you know, if you look at them, you'll notice that uh, it echoes a lot of what Aloy is going through in her own personal journey uh, and relates in some way to, to some things that she's experienced or things that are, are new to her in some cases. Uh, a good example of that is, uh, again, with the Talana quest. Uh, you know, Talana's like Aloy in some ways, but you know, as a Karja, as someone who's in the Hunter's Lodge, she's trying to uh, 
get justice for her family because their names were erased from the history books uh, from the sacrifice that they made during the Red Raids. And she's trying her to become Sunhawk in order to restore the family legacy. And so Aloy comes in and she helps her attain that that goal and, and become the Sunhawk. Uh, and for Aloy, you know, the influence on her is that even though Aloy was grew up as an outcast and she was shunned and hurt in a lot of ways, she never really experienced the gender discrimination that Talana experiences because up until very recently, women weren't allowed in the Hunter's Lodge. Uh, and even though Talana is a member and Aloy becomes a member, they still face that resistance from, uh, you know, more traditional people who are who are part of the lodge. So that's, you know, a, a new experience for Aloy. She, she's helping someone, she's influencing their life. But, you know, in Talana, she gains a friend and she's also, you know, this is the first time she's really experienced this other side of, of another culture, of another tribe. Uh, and then if you look at another quest, like with Erend, you know, he, she meets him pretty early on at the Proving uh, and then meets him again later uh, at, in Meridian. And by that point, he's lost his sister, uh, so he's, you know, grieving heavily for for the loss of his sister, who he loved very much. Uh, and Aloy comes in and helps him, you know, sort of solve that mystery of how how did she die? How what happened to her? And through that that quest, uh, you see, you know, Aloy develops his friendship with Erend, but at the same time, she kind of becomes like his his sister. He she takes, in some ways, the role that Ursa had in his life uh, by you know, being there for him, supporting him, but also yeah. trying to help him get past this grief that that he's struggling with. Um, so, yeah, just making sure that our characters have, you know, they're grounded, they are they feel real, they're trying to solve their own issues. Um, and so that has an impact on Aloy and Aloy helps them and she has an impact on their, li- their lives as well. I think that last part is especially important because um, I think, you know, when you're talking about a open world game that's single player, like the, it's the player that has the impact, right? It's like we want to make sure, of course, obviously all the characters and, and especially the ones Annie mentioned have an impact on Aloy, but the emphasis is almost always on the just really large impact that uh, Aloy and the player are having on their lives, right? So like Aaron would never have been able to f- solve this mystery about his sister's death without Aloy or um, in Talana's case, Talana, actually, I think maybe she would have made it anyway. I think so. <laughs> she would have made it anyway. But obviously, Aloy is a, is a huge help, right? Yeah, like, sure. and and I think um, one of the the really enjoyable parts of that is when they sort of take on Red Maw together, and they kind of you know they kind of uh, climb that final mountain together. Um, but um, you know, in in a game like this, it's it's sort of always about the the player's perspective, the player's experience, and we're always trying to make sure that that's the big impact, you know. So when you're playing through the story, uh, Aloy has these dialogue options, of course. Uh, so when you're interacting with other characters, you can choose uh, what she's going to say next. Were any of those options, were they canon? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, um, but my answer is is kind of uh, simple and complicated, uh, yeah. which is that they're all canon. Mm. So, you know, one of the things we wanted to do is we knew we had a game, an open world game with a very limited possibility space because it's through Aloy's eyes. So if you look at Fallout or if you look at, you know, any number of other RPGs that have a larger kind of character, um, player-driven character, that um, you can do a lot of different things. You can lie, you can cheat, you can steal, you can kill, right? And we wanted to make sure that everything is really within a space of what Aloy could do as a moral, ethical human being. I mean, that's what she is, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, but we also wanted to give the player some expressiveness and to have some branching qualities to these uh, conversations. And um, all of her responses are completely valid. All of them are within her possibility space. All of them, to me, are pretty much spot on in terms of if you wanted the canon to be a particular way. Mm-hmm. Um, and they represent, you know, three different parts of her psyche, right? Like her sort of more compassionate nature, her more aggressive nature, which is, you know, really there, right? Like Aloy has quite a lot to be angry about in the world. And also uh, her mind, her just her ability to be rational and of which she's really, really good at, good at that. So um, they were written in a way that any of them could be possible. So, I mean, ultimately it's kind of like the player's decision and that was sort of the point. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. 
Uh, you already mentioned like Aloy being raised as an outcast kind of me- meant that she uh, didn't grow up with certain things like experiences, like different relationships and beliefs and cultures uh, up until the proving at least. And what do you think is her mindset when entering uh, different tribe lands and getting to learn all about those differences? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, when Aloy leaves the sacred lands after the proving, uh, this it's first of all, just a brand new world for her to explore, right, and and, and discover, and that's the same for the player. Um, but, you know, because of her upbringing as an outcast, because of all the hurt she's endured her whole life, that really uh, skews the way she looks at the world. And um, not just that, but she has the focus, right? So she knows much more about uh, the world than, than the, at least the Nora do. And as she explores the lands, uh, realizes, you know, she's pretty unique in, in that sense. And... Um, so when she goes into these other lands and and meets these new people, she has this eye for, you know, she wants to help those who are in need, those who are suffering. Um, and because of the own her own past, you know, she's very skeptical about traditions and taboo and superstitions that not just the Nora have, but all tribes have. So she's, you know, very driven. She's not going to let tribal taboo get in the way of doing what's right, what she believes is right. Um, so, yeah, that's that's sort of her her interaction with those, those tribes as she goes into the world. Yeah, one of the things we wanted to do when we were developing that stuff is make sure that the attraction and the uh, emphasis and uh, the way Eloy is compelled to help is focused on the characters, the individual characters and never the tribe. Yeah. Uh, the tribes have all kinds of problems, you know, like they're like – the Karja and Asaram are kind of like brutally sexist. The uh, Shadow Karja are, well, I mean, that's like a... Uh, that's like, a whole other episode. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's a very dangerous regime, right? Yeah. And, and the Nora have their share of problems. So Aloy has no tribe, right? Like, and, and that's deliberate uh, because because in a, in a certain sense, the player has no tribe. But um, we always want to make sure that there's these really, really compelling characters that draw her into the tribal experience. <laughs> What are your most remembered scenes uh, with Aloy, either from the developer uh, sp- perspective or from the player? Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, the one that sticks out the most is when she comes out of All Mother Mountain after learning the truth. Um, you know, because we've talked a lot about how she was raised as an outcast and how the Nora have always rejected her. And, you know, here she is. She's wanted this her whole life, all these answers, and she finally has them. And she's still kind of processing and reeling from this discovery. And she comes out of the mountain and then, you know, all the Nora are gathered there. And instead of shunning her like she's used to, they now worship her. They get down on their knees and worship her and think she's the anointed of, mm-hmm. of all mother. And, you know, on some level, you would think that, you know, maybe that's what she's always wanted. She's always wanted this sort of acceptance. But instead, you know, it taps into all of that hurt that she's had her whole life, all of all of her experiences. And she actually rejects all of that and says, you know, she doesn't belong to them. She's she she belongs to the world, basically. Um, So that was just really cool to see, you know, her coming, her getting those revelations and then coming to face with with the tribe and and making that decision about like, no, I I don't accept this and I am going to try and save the world. For me, I think it's, uh, you know, we had no idea when we were developing the game how it would land. Zero, right? Like, we had spent years developing this project. Like, it was a big change for the studio, um, and there was no real indication necessarily of, of how successful it would be, and, and its success kind of, like, was bigger than we ever kind of imagined. But there was a moment uh, when um, the ending of the game the epilogue was uh, shot and the voices had been recorded and we were seeing that for the first time. And people around the studio were crying, you know, when they saw it. And, and, and like when I saw it, you know, I'm kind of like tearing up. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of when we knew that, um, okay, well, we don't know how this game as a whole is going to be received, but clearly there's some emotional impact to, to Aloy's journey. And just as an aside, another uh, little bit that's kind of dear to me personally is the wrap-up of the story with Aloy and Erend. Um, I think there's a really nice moment there where he, you know, because when they first meet, uh, he's kind of hitting on her a little bit, and she's having none of it, and he seems a little brash. But then at the end of their quest line, he kind of says to her, I'm not going to get the exact words right, but it's sort of like, 
I'm glad I was just worth a second of your time. And you really kind of feel it, you know, that he kind of knows that he's a little bit, uh, she's out of his league. <laughs> and, uh, but also that he really, really cares about her and respects her and, and, and vice versa, right? Because she has a really nice response to you. So that's always been a moment that I've really liked. Do you think it occurred to many players when we made it to Maker's End that Aloy was a clone of Elizabeth? I think so, yes. So basically the way this was written was you get this big revelation, right? That uh, So you get to Maker's End, you, you get the conversations with uh, Ted Farrow and with Elizabeth uh, Sobeck and those holograms. And then what happens immediately after is you talk to Silence. And you can ask Silent a bunch of stuff, actually. I think he doesn't really want to answer your questions, but you can answer a bunch of stuff. And if you look at that dialogue in the game, it really is focused on all these science fictional possibilities of what's going on uh, between Aloy and Elizabeth Sobeck. So, you know, I, 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 my memory is a little bit uh, cloudy, but I think there's basically the subtext of like, could, could my mother still be alive? Yeah. You know, could, could she... Um, somehow, you know, have been frozen. Like there's like all these different sort of possibilities that you can kind of ask him about. And it also works great because um, the player uh, doesn't know a ton about the science fictional underpinnings of the world at that point, right? Like the big revelations are still coming. Yeah. So this is a point where we're really able to tease it and like silence was able to, oh, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And I, but I mean, absolutely, I think players were thinking at that point, okay, well, you know, it's probably not a mother-daughter thing directly, right? Because how would that really work? So cloning has to be on their minds at some point. Yeah. I mean, just playing the game, uh, you know, at the very, towards the beginning, at the, right after the proving when Aloy wakes up in the mountain and she sees that recording uh, from her focus or from the, the eclipse focus, um, you see this image of, of Elizabeth. And for me as a player, you know, that already got my mind rolling on like, what could the possibilities be? You know, this, she obviously looks like her. There's something going on with a genetic match. Uh, so yeah, I think really early on, you're already like trying to figure out what's going on. But I think the game does a really good job of pacing that out and you keeps you guessing all the way up until much later in the story. Yeah. On that note, um, the, uh, the whole uh, thing there that works, I think, is also that Aloy doesn't know what a clone is at that point, mm. right? At that exact point, yeah. she doesn't know, which is cool because the player gets ahead of Aloy a little bit potentially, yeah. but then we get to see Aloy kind of get educated in this whole sort of like science fictional underpinning of this of the old world, right? So it's nice because we can kind of have it both ways. The player can be suspecting it a little bit, but Aloy doesn't know it. And it's still pleasurable to kind of ride that intellectual journey with, with Aloy and kind of figure that out. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, towards the end of the story, Aloy is dealt two very quick blows. Uh, after discovering uh, Ted Farrow's deleted the Apollo archives and, you know, murdered all the authors and, you know, and that Elizabeth sacrificed herself. What emotions was Aloy experiencing at the time as she also dealt with listening to silence in her ear who was not, you know, particularly kind? I mean, I, I looked at that moment in the game recently, and um, I think that that little exchange with silence really says a lot. Mm. I think Aloy's got a couple of different options there, but really it boils down to, look, dude, you know, you may think of uh, Elizabeth's sacrifice and the reactions to it as this kind of, you know, sentimentality that's unnecessary. But the reality is it's that emotional drive that she had and that she gave the people around her and her need to save the world. It comes from the heart. It comes from, it comes from a desire, an, you know, a moral, ethical desire to save humanity that um, emotion is like really, really important. You, you cold-hearted guy, <laughs> you know? And, um, and that's also one of the few moments in the game where uh, he cedes something to her, where he sort of says, yeah, okay, maybe you're right. And he doesn't, that's not a silence thing to say, you know? Um, I think that really sums up at least her reaction to uh, her genetic mother's death, which is like, she kind of gets it. She kind of gets it, right? She understands the importance of that sacrifice, what went into it and what it means. Uh, in terms of, of, of Ted Farrow and, and, you know, killing the alphas and, and that whole thing. I mean, I think Aloy just feels just in silence too, uh, just in rage. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, it's like, here's a guy who, because of his ego and because of his... Uh, need to cover up his own culpability, you know, murdered not only, you know, a room full of people, but also the entire cultural history of the world, right? Yeah. Like, so he's, you know, I mean, I think they're, they're, they're pretty upset. For sure. Yeah. 
I mean, for me, when I was playing the game and we get to that moment, you know, it's it's one of those moments where even after you, you know, put turn the game off and, and walk away, it's just kind of bothering you in the mm, back of your mind. Yeah. Like it's just haunting you. I'm like, I can't believe someone would do that. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. When we were developing that, um, we had a lot of questions about how the holograms in the game would really come across. Obviously, there's these like really full-blown cinematic moments throughout the game, and then there's these kind of blue holograms, right? And we weren't really sure how they would land. But I think that moment is the moment where the holograms really, really work Mm -hmm. because it's like you're kind of there, you're kind of in the room, you see those people sit down, and then they kind of, you see them just die like in front of you. And it's like, that's where I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm really glad we did it this way, Mm -hmm. you know, instead of like trying to do a more cinematic treatment of that because it just makes it more effective to to kind of be there in the moment yeah 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 Yeah, because you're still controlling Aloy at that point and you can walk around the room but you can't do anything about what you're seeing you just have to just let it happen yeah what kind of closure did Aloy get from being the one to to defeat Helis an enemy who took Rost who took her blossoming relationship with Vala uh, from her at the start of the game well I think Aloy says it pretty well. So I went back and I looked at that bit and I forgot kind of how sharp she is with Helis, which is understandable. Mm-hmm. But I mean, basically what she's saying to him is like, you don't matter, mm-hmm. right? I mean, like there's three different flavors of it. And, uh, and one of them is literally, I don't have time for this, right? Yeah. I don't have time for this. I have a pressing business <laughs> on the matters. alight, <laughs> you know, like uh, the city's falling apart. Hades is the real enemy. That has to be stopped. But I think that's also really important, which is that, like, obviously, of course, there is vengeance involved for Rost. And in two of the uh, incarnations of that moment, she does say, like, you know, turn turn your face to the sun, right? Because this is the moment where she gets Mm. uh, her throat cut. But so there is vengeance, no question. But in the end, she knows that he's not the primary antagonist, right? It's like Hades is responsible for everything. And not only that, Helis is a fool. At the end of the day, Helos is a fool. He's a dupe. He's mm-hmm. someone who was used for this purpose. And she even says that. She says, you know, uh, you're not the chosen. You know, uh, Hades chose you because you're a fool. Yeah. And um, and the, the message there is that, you know, this guy is going to be relegated to the dustbin of history. And that's exactly the right message because she's got really, really important things to do, uh, you know, across the way. Yeah. And the team provided the player with the opportunity to visit Ross's grave, you know, throughout the game where Aloy would provide him with updates about, you know, what she was experiencing, what was happening in the world. What impact do you think that that had on the players? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, being able to go back and, and visit Ross at various points in the game, it really shows the impact that Ross had on Aloy's life. You know, he because his, his actual involvement in the story seems like it ends pretty early with the proving. Um, but you see, you know, just how much Ross meant to her, you know, how how much she cared about, about him and how much uh, he taught her, all those lessons that he taught her. Um, and for me, you know, it's, it's this nice introspective, reflective moment for her because most of the time during the rest of the game, she's very focused and driven and just concentrating on, you know, what she needs to do next, what what threats she's facing. But these moments allow her to, you know, just take a, take a bit, bit and and just talk to him and, and connect with him and, and sort of give him the updates on what's happening. Um, but I think one thing that's just really, really interesting about Aloy and Ross's relationship is that Rost, you know, at, at his core, he's very, he was very Nora and he believed wholeheartedly in uh, the Nora traditions and their laws. And, you know, because of Aloy as an outcast and uh, with the focus, you know, she just knows so much more about the world. She never f- agreed with, with that viewpoint and she never could. Um, so there's, you know, she cares about him a lot. She misses him dearly. But at the same time, there's always this, feeling that they were never, they could never fully understand each other, that they were never in sync in that way um, because they just had these differences of of their beliefs. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's one of the things I really like about the way that dialogue is written because it doesn't try to resolve the relationship. Mm-hmm. Like it, it tries to expand on it a little bit and to give it some depth and also to kind of recap the story and it does all these things, but it's never trying to kind of like say this is done or this is, it's this has a sort of completely happy ending, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, you were talking about it already a little bit, but how did the team decide that Elizabeth should be the one that actually uh, sacrifices herself? I think for us, it was just clear that she needed a heroic death. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no way that she could wind up just being kind of like overrun by the swarm. Like that seems like a very uh, mundane way for her to die in the context of, of what every, was going on for everyone else. And I think um, it also had to be something always, always, always for uh, Aloy to aspire to, right? Like it couldn't just be that, um, you know, Aloy's kind of trying to live up to Sobek's example. It had to be that Sobek's example is is a paragon always, yeah. right? That like whatever she does is in the service of humanity. And that seemed like uh, 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 that it had to have that kind of moment. I think it also... Um, it also has the nice little seed, of course, that we wanted to plant in terms of like the um, of the uh, resting place of of her, her genetic mother. Right? There's actually a line that I had forgotten about, but right in there where she says, like, I, she said she wanted to go home. I wonder if, and Silence is like, what? Mm. And she's like, nothing. But that little seed, you know, kind of helps plant the epilogue and like her going to kind of find that. So. Uh, I think it just works on on a number of levels, but mostly it was just like this had to be epic, right? Like how could her – her life is epic, you know, her impact on the future is epic. How could her death not be epic, you yeah. know? Why did the team choose that moment as the ending of the of the story, actually, this super emotional closure of, of Aloy's journey? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways to look at the game. Um, there's – it's, you know, at its core, it's a, it's a tribal machine hunter that's battling these machines. Um, it's – uh, set in this like beautiful natural environment has all these tribes that are interesting. Um, it's an open world game. It's it's uh, it's got a lot of um, alternate uh, what what alt future or science fictional elements. But when you're trying to design a story like that, at the end of the day, a story like that has to be about a protagonist and a desire. And Aloy's desire is really simple. I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier. It's like she wants her mommy. And everything kind of uh, comes from that. And you can't have that story where she doesn't find her mommy, mm-hmm. right? And she finds her mommy in a number of different ways, right? But it needs the moment where she feels a little bit of her mother's embrace. Mm-hmm. And that's what that moment is. It, the story is simply not complete unless she gets what she wants and what she gets is a kind of hug in that hug. It's, it's verbal, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, it has to do with like, well, if I ever had a daughter, I'd want her to be like pretty much exactly like Aloy, right? <laughs> and, um, and you can, you, you, you hear it, you feel it, you see Aloy feeling it, you feel Aloy feeling it and it all comes to come together. And the reason why it comes together is not just because it's, it's a great scene. Uh, it, it comes together because that's what the whole game is about. You know, it, it's about uh, a woman who's trying to find uh, her origin and ultimately trying to connect with a parent that she never had. And on that note, we're going to start bringing this episode to a close now. But we hope you have enjoyed joining us for this deep dive into Aloy's origin. Thank you so much to Ben and Annie for joining us today. How did you find this episode? I mean, it's always fun to talk about Aloy. And <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's great. And it's also fun just to kind of reminisce a little bit about the development of the, of the game. Agreed. Same. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's really nice just, yeah, to talk about Aloy and to, you know, sort of relive the her early uh, part of her adventures in Zero Dawn. And Anna, thank you so much for co-hosting. How did you find today's episode? It was super interesting. Thank you so much for coming to the podcast today. Let us know what you think on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You can also let us know via the hashtag Horizon Gaiacast. This is just the beginning of an ongoing series and we'll be back with a new episode very soon where we'll be taking a look at the 21st century, including some significant events that took place before and during the Pharaoh Plague. We hope you'll join us again for that episode. We'll see you next time. Bye.